everyone. Welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Kimani Hendricks, the Multimedia Communications Coordinator for MS Focus. And today, Dr. Ben Thrower will be answering your MS-related questions for the next hour. Before I introduce him, I would like to address those who would have questions for Dr. Thrower on how to ask them. So if you're watching us from Zoom, you can answer, you can ask questions by either typing them into the Q&A and the chat box. You can also use the raise hand feature by pressing the button at the bottom of your screen. But if you are on Zoom on your phone, press star nine to raise your hand and wait to be unmuted. If you are watching us from Facebook Live, you can type your questions into the comment section below. Dr. Thrower is the, um, the medical director of the Andrew C. Carlos MS Institute at the Shepherd Center. He previously served as the medical director of the Holy MS Family, I'm sorry, the Holy Family MS Center in Spokane, Washington. Dr. Thrower is also the senior medical advisor for MS Focus and he contributes to our quarterly magazine. Dr. Thrower, I'll turn it over to you for opening comments, and then hopefully we'll get into some questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of the other staff at MS Focus. As always, we appreciate you very much. Um, good afternoon to everyone out there. Thank you for joining, and happy Valentine's Day. So this is our chance to kind of have a free-for-all uh, question and answer. Um, pretty much everything is, is open for discussion. Um, Try as much as you can to keep your questions focused and to, to the broader audience. So, you know, if, if we can avoid sort of getting too much into to deep details about your personal situation, that'll let us get through a lot more questions uh, as we go through the afternoon. So with that, let's see what we've got. Uh, the first person I saw was Karen, and you can unmute. Hi, good afternoon. Hi there. Uh, I, I have sort of a two part, if I may. I've been reading about the GFAP blood serum uh, as a, a, a way to detect silent progression in MS. And is that just in clinical trials or is that something that's gonna be on the market soon? And, and the information about PPMS being a totally separate disease or, you know, as diff more different than previously thought, I'm reading some of that as well. And I feel like those two things for me kind of go together. Um, yeah, they're both great questions. So there is a lot of work on different uh, serum markers. And so these, these markers like GFAP and neurofilament light chain, they may be looking at measures of inflammation or they might be looking at measures of nerve fiber or axonal breakdown. And so neurofilament light chain, there are some commercial assays out there available now. Um, it, it still feels like the whole field is kind of early. Um, I, uh, we, we just met recently with a group that has a, a whole panel of, of blood markers that they've put together. And I just, I, I'm not sure we know quite what to do with them yet. I do think it will be something that we probably use in the future. Um, I, outside of research right now, I, I don't think it's quite ready to be used every day in the clinic. Obviously, for something like primary progressive MS, which you, which you rightly point out, we've always thought of as being a little different. Maybe it's more different than we had, had really known. Some of those measures of axonal degeneration, more so than inflammation, might, might be really important because we don't think there's a huge inflammatory component to primary progressive MS. It's always been a challenge from a therapeutic standpoint most of our, our disease-modifying therapies are in one way or another anti-inflammatory. And if primary progressive MS doesn't have a ton of inflammation, might, maybe that's why our therapies have not been as effective as we would like for them to be. So, so yes, the, the GFAP is one of a number of different markers that are, are being looked at. Uh, some in early or uh, are, are commercially available in an early phase. I just, I'm not quite ready yet to use them outside of research. And I would say, yeah, definitely stay tuned on the for more on the primary progressive MS because we clearly need more answers there and ultimately a, more therapies. Thank you. 
We have a question in the Q&A from Patty. She says, um, the sensory issues in my feet are affecting my walking, especially with shoes on. Do you have anything for neuropathy? So, so when people have sensory issues, it, it can be a couple of different things. So there are people deal with pain, uh, neuropathic pain. So it's rare in MS that you see just plain old boring numbness. Usually it's loss of sensation and something else. My feet are burning. There's water running down my leg when there's nothing there. There's electric buzzing when there's nothing there. So if it's the pain part of things, that yes, our whole crops of different medications uh, that are out there uh, that can be used for that. The other way that sen loss of sensation or altered sensation can affect someone's walking is through loss of proprioception or position sense. So every joint in our body has a position receptor so that we can tell if a joint is moving without actually looking at it. If you have decreased position sense or proprioception in the feet, you are at risk for something called a sensory ataxia. Ataxia means you're walking like maybe you've had a drink too many, your balance is off, your feet are widely spaced, you know where the walls are, you know where people are around you to help with your balance. Uh, sensory means you're doing that because you don't have good position sense. We don't have a medication uh, as of yet that would restore sensation or, and improve someone's walking. But what we do know is that working with a therapist, working with a trainer to improve your core strength will pay dividends in terms of your balance. So any exercise that improves your core strength will tend to to help with you with your balance, whether it's yoga, you know, Pilates, you know, anything that's out out there. And there are a lot of great online resources. If you can't get to a facility, uh, or you can't get to a physical therapist to have them give you an exercise program, there are again a ton of different online free exercise programs that might help with your core strength and your balance. Teresa says, President Biden claims the pandemic is over. Doubt it. Is it? <laughs> New York just really uh, relaxed the mask policy for nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Should they have done this in your professional opinion? So there are epidemiologic definitions of pandemic. So, uh, you know, infectious disease specialists and epidemiologists can tell you what threshold do you, you know, does it take to call something a pandemic? Just because we may not be above that threshold to say, you know, the, uh, we're, maybe we don't meet the strict definition of a pa pandemic. Does that mean the virus is gone? No. I mean, obviously, COVID is still out there. And so, you know, COVID continues to evolve. And it, it, I think the good news is it looks like it is evolving in a direction that it may be trying to blend in with other coronaviruses. So, you know, as it stands right now, it looks like COVID is, is very, very contagious but not making people as sick as the original version of COVID or the Delta variant did. So I think President Biden may be technically correct that we may be below the threshold for a pandemic, but that doesn't mean that the virus is gone. And you, every one of us has to make a decision for what's right for us. And, and there's no one right answer. You know, if you're a person living with MS, your decision may be different from someone else's. And so yeah, I think you just have to kind of be aware of what your local numbers are looking like, you know, track those, you know, as we're in the winter months, you know, that uh, a lot of viruses are obviously gonna, gonna creep up. And, and also be aware too, that, that COVID, COVID is not the only virus that we're dealing with. We've had, you know, here in Atlanta, and uh, for instance, October, November, we were just rampant with influenza and RSV. Those, you can get very, very sick with influenza and RSV uh, as well as COVID. Um, just as a side note, to, just to update people, you know, we, we were offering Evusheld, the COVID monoclonal antibodies to people on MS therapies that might affect their ability to make antibodies to vaccines or boosters. That Evusheld product has had its, its emergency use authorization withdrawn. There was no problem with the product. The virus has outsmarted us. The virus has evolved and it is no longer responding to Evusheld as well as it was in the past. So, so right now we really, we don't have a replacement for Evusheld. So you know, if you're on a drug like Ocrevus or another B-cell therapy where we were offering Evusheld, 
we, we just don't really have a, a great answer right now. I, I do anticipate there will probably be an Ebuchel 2.0 at some point, of, you know, a new version that takes into account the new Omicron variants, but, but we don't have it yet. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, mentioned that, Dr. Thrower, because there was a question emailed to us from Roos, who said that he is on Ocrevus and he was on Evusheld. His um, antibody levels were greater than 2,500, but since being on Ocrevus and having the vaccines and boosters, his antibodies are at zero. So, um, so that's that is the most common scenario that we see in our uh, Ocrevus and other B cell therapy patients. So. So you you still make a T cell response if you're on a B cell therapy like Okrava. So if you get a vaccine or booster, you're still getting something. The problem is we have no great commercial blood test to measure the T cell response. We can measure the antibody response, like he said, and the, you know the, his zero antibody response to boosters or vaccines on Ocrevus is, is pretty typical for what we're seeing. And he would be the exact person that we would have given Evyshell to before, but you know, we just, we don't have that option at this point. Again, hopefully we'll get something to replace it. Um, would the, does that mean that you shouldn't get boosted or vaccinated if you're on Ocrevus for, for COVID? I still think there's some benefit to doing it. You get the T cell response. So, you know, certainly wouldn't discourage anyone from, from getting vaccine or vaccinated or boosted, even though you're not making an antibody response. Hopefully there will be a replacement for every child soon, sooner than later. Absolutely. Yeah. Caroline um, asks, she says, first, I am currently on Jelenia, uh, which has now gone generic. My doctor wants me to switch to Zyposia. Uh, do you have any concerns with the use of Zyposia and what are your thoughts with the generic version of Jelenia? So, you know, on generics, so there is a there is a true generic for for Jelenia. And so with generics, you know, these are non-brand name. They have to show that they are bioequivalent to the, the name brand. What that means is that they have to be within 80 to 125% of the pharmacokinetics of the original drug. Um, I wish it was a tighter window. Um, I, would I prefer that someone be able to stay on the name brand with, generic, uh, with Jelenia? Probably. Um, do we always win that fight? No, unfortunately not. And then there's another version of, it's, it's called a branded generic with Jelenia. There is a company that came out with a version that's a different uh, release mechanism. So it is a branded version and they've got pretty good data behind the, that version of Jelenia. So if you look up branded uh, uh, Jelenia alternative, I like Zaposia. I think it's a great drug. So the, it is brand name only. It is in the same class as Jelenia. They're both S1P receptor modulators. Um, I think, you know, if you if the interest is staying on a, a known brand name drug, I think the advantage of moving to the, the Zaposia is your, there, there is no generic version of that. So I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable option. We have a question uh, from Facebook, Terry. She wants to know, or he, not sure. Uh, how do you feel about red light therapy? Um, I think they're, they're, I would put that in kind of the alternative complementary realm. And it's, it's a therapy where there's not a lot of hard data on it. But on the other hand, I, I can't perceive of any big risk that there would be there's a so things like red light therapy low dose laser therapy there's a there's a theory that you know maybe they work immunologically to you know to change your immune system and promote healing in some way i think the theory is interesting i i don't know that there's a lot of hard data to back it up uh, if someone asks me you know should i try it i would say if you know if it doesn't break the bank and your interest i don't think there's any big risk to it i just don't have a lot of hard data to say that it that it's effective. We have another question from Facebook. Um, someone says, I wanted to try now, if please help me in uh, pronouncing this, it's spelled N-I-A-C-I-N. Uh, niacin, the N-I-A, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. They said uh, they wanted to try that, but they don't know what would be a safe amount to take. If you have any recommendations for a safe dosage, I don't on that one. So the you know, so niacin has been used for many many years to treat um, um, hyperlipidemia. Um, the one downside that you know when you're using niacin is is there is this side effect called the niacin flush. So you get this you know, big head to toe lobster red reaction that uh, it, there's nothing dangerous. It's not an allergic reaction. It can be just uncomfortable. It's very similar to what some patients on Tecfidera or dimethyl fumarate or Vumerity uh, sometimes get as a side effect. So again, nothing dangerous, but just know about it. I've not seen any specific dosing guidelines. And, and again, it's not something that I recommend uh, routinely. Was that a, a written question or a uh, question? It came from Facebook. Yeah, if that person, if, whoever sent that in, if they could just uh, maybe send a, a little addendum on there. So what were they hoping to accomplish with the, the niacin? Okay, hopefully they'll put that in the chat. Meanwhile, I'll return to Q&A. Karen wants to know, can foot drop get better even if you've had it longer than three years? So foot drop, any neurological symptom that has been present in MS for longer, longer than a year, the, the statistics are not great on it getting better spontaneously. That doesn't mean you can't work with it and function around it. So with foot drop, I think it's one of the most under-treated symptoms that we see in MS. It obviously affects people's walking drastically. So if, you know, if you've not seen a physical therapist, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, sometimes what we see mixed in with foot drop is it's not only the weakness of the ability to get the toes off the ground, some people, in addition to that, have some tightness or spasticity, so their foot's actually being driven into the ground. So you get this double hit of weakness going up and the muscles wanting, wanting to drive your toes down into the ground. A physical therapist can really help out with that. If there is a component of spasticity that's driving your foot down, that's very treatable. You know, there are things like stretching or, or medications or both. Um, you know, with foot drop, Typically, a physical therapists are going to recommend an ankle foot orthotic, and for some people, those are wonderful. There is the, the Bioness uh, device, the, the functional electrical stimulation device, which works beautifully for some people. And just recently, the FDA has approved the neural sleeve from Psionics, another type of nerve stimulator. Um, our therapist, we just had a meeting this morning, and I was asking our therapist about the, the neural sleeve. We, they've not had a ton of experience. We What we would like to do is when we have these new pieces of technology, we like to partner with that company and get some trial units so that, that people can try it in the real world before we go start fighting with their insurance company to, to pay for it. So this, the neural sleeve looks very cool. Um, again, it's, it's going to be some competition for the Bioness uh, device. But yeah, so take home messages. If you've not seen a physical therapist, please, please do so. An anonymous attendee wants to learn more on plasma transfer treatment. So plasma exchange is something that we usually think of for in the acute setting. So if someone's had a big, bad relapse. So plasma exchange involves putting some type of, of large IV in, and it's almost the, it's analogous almost to like a dialysis machine. So your your blood is going through this machine, and and bad antibodies are being taken out. So if you have a a rip roaring relapse that is really affecting your level of functioning, and you've not responded to steroids, or maybe you have a medical contraindication to steroids. Um, and maybe we don't want to use IV immune globulin or try to IVIG. Plasma exchange, also called PLEX, um, is something that can be done. It's usually uh, it's, uh, every other day times, times uh, two weeks, so seven exchanges total. There are a handful of MS centers out there that do plasma exchange on a long-term basis, uh, so they use it as a maintenance therapy. This is pretty uncommon. Uh, it, I think there's you know, some downsides to it. There are fluid shifts that go on 
with plasma exchange, you do have to have you know, some kind of large IV in on a long-term basis. So, so again, typically we're thinking of plasma exchange in the acute setting for severe relapses. Yvonne wants to know if you've seen instances where COVID triggered MS. I have not personally. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's several databases out there. Um, I think it is entirely possible that if someone has MS, that the COVID um, could, could provoke a pseudo exacerbation. Any viral infection that revs up your immune system has the potential to cause pseudo or, or, or false exacerbations. The symptoms aren't false. It's just that there's something provoking that, that event. I think it is possible that a person who is maybe has underlying MS, maybe it's just lying under the surface. Could it be that a, a viral infection like COVID is the final straw that unmasks that? I think that's entirely possible. I've not seen it. In that case, it wouldn't really be that the COVID is causing MS. It was just the final insult to your immune system. So genetically, that person was already you know, at risk for MS. Maybe they had had all the, the, you know, the other risk factors were there, and then the COVID might be just that final thing that, that tips you over. Got a long one coming, Dr. Thrower. Forgive me. I did take my glasses off, and that was probably <laughs> not a good idea. But Kim says um, she was diagnosed with MS, relapsing remitting in 2001, was in a trial for Tysabri that went well. Then she was diagnosed benign in 2010 due to having no symptoms for the next two and a half years. She says that it returned in 2022 as secondary progressive MS. So she's confused about what medications to take and what's safe now after 20 years later. So she's just looking for general advice. Yeah. So there's a lot, lot there. So I, I guess one comment first on just that term benign MS. It, it's a really controversial term. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that would argue that that benign MS doesn't exist. That the more appropriate term would be mild MS. Clearly, across across the MS spectrum, there are people who have much more, you know, aggressive forms with a lot more active inflammation, and people who have milder forms. Um, I think. Her MS clearly did well for a while after Tysabri. To get into the Tysabri trial, she had to have active MS. That, you know, that trial required that you have a certain number of relapses and a certain number of MRI findings. What may have happened, and I think we do see this, is that Tysabri may have kind of reset her immune system for a while. Hopefully, there were maybe MRIs being done during that two-year period off of, uh, of, of treatment where things were felt to be in the milder form. Secondary progressive MS is now subdivided into active and inactive. Active secondary progressive MS means that the person still has relapses and or new lesions on MRI. Inactive means there's no relapses, no new lesions on MRI. Most FDA approved therapies for MS are also approved for active secondary progressive MS. So if someone is still having relapses, still has new lesions on MRI, really the whole toolbox is open. If someone has inactive secondary progressive MS, technically there is no FDA approved treatment. And that really gets down to a discussion between the healthcare team and the person with MS. Does does inactive secondary progressive MS mean there's no inflammation whatsoever? Probably not. It just, our therapies have just not been as effective. One of the things that we feel very strongly about at Shepherd, and I know other MS are do too, is having inactive sec secondary progressive MS doesn't mean that we don't still treat you as a whole person. There is still symptom management. We really encourage our folks with, with secondary pro progressive MS to be actively engaged in exercise programs, physical therapy programs, because we can improve function. And we want those people, those folks to stay engaged, but also to kind of see what's going on in research. I do think that as we get closer to maybe repair strategies, it could be that this group who has probably been underserved, secondary progressive MS without activity, maybe the first in line when we start seeing you know some of these these repair strategy trials coming on board another anonymous attendee says they are newly diagnosed and wants to know if ms 
makes them feel tired is supposed to make them feel tired all the time. They say they eat well and they take their medication and get a good night's sleep, but they're just always very tired. I just imagine I'm, what we're hearing in the background is a resounding yes from all the, the people listening in who've been dealing with MS uh, for a while. So so fatigue is, has always been um, the number one symptom complaint that people with MS deal with. And for some, it, they would list it as, as their most bothersome symptom. Um, so, so we want to make sure when the person is having low energy, um, that we're not dealing with some other things mixed in with that. So if you have inadequate sleep or poor sleep hygiene, that's going to contribute to low energy levels in the daytime. If you're on sedating medications, if you have other health issues, so we want to make sure we're not always blaming just the MS. If it really is primarily your MS, MS fatigue comes in two flavors. There's lassitude, which is non-exertional, non-heat related. I didn't do anything. Someone just unplugged my energy supply fatigue. Um, and then there's nerve fiber fatigue. That's the more heat related, exercise related fatigue. You know, be sure to talk to your healthcare team about your, your fatigue. It's almost like there needs to be a different term because when we say I'm tired, in you know, a person with MS, it probably doesn't do the symptom justice because typically the fatigue we see with MS is is very limiting. It it affects people's daily activities. It's more than just I'm a little tired. I've had a busy day. It's the end of the workday type of fatigue. So make sure your healthcare team is aware, you know, of what you're dealing with. One of the challenges we've had in the the MS healthcare world is as we get newer and more advanced disease modifying therapies, a lot of these therapies require more safety monitoring, more discussions with the individual with MS about what, you know, which therapy do we wanna do, which are we continuing. Sometimes what we lose time for is those more in-depth discussions about things like fatigue. So make sure you, that you, know, you, you make your team aware that that's, that's a big issue for you. I'm gonna to return to some viewers from Facebook. Felicia asks, are we protected from COVID since our immune system is overactive? Does HLA B27 protect from COVID as well? Yeah, so there was a there was some hope, you know, early in the COVID pandemic that exactly what she said that okay, my immune system is on alert status, it's relatively revved up. We do sometimes hear people with MS say, you know, before I was diagnosed, if there was a virus going through my family, I usually didn't get it, or I was the last one to get it if I did. So, so there could be something there. It has not seemed to translate into any real world COVID protection though. Um, I mean, studies have looked at the risk of COVID in individuals with MS, uh, severity of COVID outside of medications that might, that might suppress your immune system. And just MS by itself, the diagnosis of MS, it, it doesn't seem to have a a significantly meaningful impact on your risk of, of getting COVID or being protected from COVID. Um, the HLA types, I mean, the, I think there have been trends that some HLA types and maybe some blood types, uh, specifically blood type O, might have some you know mild protective effect. But man, I, I just don't think it's enough to, I, I wouldn't make any lifestyle decisions or treatment decisions about HLA type or, or blood type. Uh, enough to hang your hat on. So we've got another um, anonymous attendee, long one, so be warned, <laughs> says, have you seen immune resetting long-term after COVID vaccine? I had one Pfizer shot and two years later, it didn't appear, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't appear that I will uh, return to where I was pre-vaccine. My symptoms from 20 and 30 years ago are radically reappearing, and the only Rx drug I was using was low-dose naltrexone for a comorbid condition. Yes, yeah, so the, there has been a lot of research looking at how people with MS respond to vaccinations. It looks like the side effect risk of vaccination in people with MS is probably not different than the, the general community. 
there, you know, some of the the vaccines, um, the so in the early trials, there was were some reported cases of transverse myelitis. But in fairness, almost every vaccine we've ever had does carry some risk of an autoimmune reaction, whether it's Guillain-Barre syndrome or Bell's palsy or transverse myelitis. So I don't know that the COVID vaccines were significantly different in that risk. These are, you know, these are messenger RNA vaccines. And so the, you know, the, but when you think about the way they work, I just have a hard time thinking that there would be a long-term sort of an immune effect one way or the other. Um, if a person's symptoms are worsening over time, I guess there's one question, could, could it have been provoked by the vaccine or was this, is this MS progression that was just coincidental? Was it going to happen regardless? Um, I, I have heard a few of our folks say, yeah, I, I do think that my MS symptoms have gotten a little more active. And I think we certainly respect that, that individual story. And maybe that when we think about the risk benefit ratio of further vaccination or boosters, maybe that's someone that we don't encourage to get boosted. But in the big scheme of things, I don't think we've seen the risk of side effects any worse in the MS community than in the general population with back, with COVID vaccinations. We've got a question from Nicholas. It's pretty general. He says, do you have any advice to a newly diagnosed patient? Um, I think th that's a bit, you're right, that's a big, big question. So you want to get to a point, I think with your MS, where you're being proactive, you've got a game plan. So realize everything you do in MS treatment-wise is you're either treating relapses, hopefully you're very, doing very little of that, you're managing symptoms or you're changing the long-term course. Hopefully you're spending most of your time in those second uh, and third buckets, managing any symptoms you have come up and, and doing something to protect yourself in the long run. And what I like to see newly diagnosed individuals get to a point of is that there's a happy balance. You're dealing with your MS on one hand, but it isn't dominating your life. When you're newly diagnosed, it may be at a it's going to have a bigger you know, role in your life right now because you're thinking about it. You're coming up with a game plan. But we love to see people with, people with MS get to the point where whatever their life plans were for work, home, family, that hopefully we're able to maintain those plans as much as possible. Before I move on to the next question, uh, the person who was asking about the safe dosage of niacin, they got back to you and said they wanted to use it to help regenerate demyelination. So I would say there, the evidence there in terms of remyelination is really, really preliminary. Um, I, I think if you can take niacin without getting a flush um, with it, I think it's, it's, it's perfectly safe. I just don't, I, I think the data on remyelination with, with niacin is, is pretty weak at this, at this point. Um, I'll do some research and look up appropriate dosing. Uh, if, we would probably want to keep it on the lower side just to, to minimize the risk of, of um, that flushing reaction. Karen in the Q&A says, do you recommend patients get any blood tests if they take Ampira? So there is no blood testing required with Empira or Dalfampridine. Um, we, we do use caution if you have renal dysfunction. So if you were starting it and you know, we were had any concerns, maybe you have hypertension, diabetes, history of kidney disease, we might want to just make sure you've got normal kidney function before we start it because the drug is ultimately excreted through the kidneys. And so if you have altered kidney function, you can build up higher levels and potentially have side effects. But there is no safety blood testing required as a direct result of the drug itself. Another question, uh, Ms. Coleman says, how do you feel about the generic version of Tecfidera? So I'm, I am more okay with that one than I am probably the generic Gelenia. And the, the reason being is that Tecfidera dimethyl fumarate is a really, really simple molecule. Um, when that drug got FDA approval, Tecfidera back in the day, we have a compounding pharmacy here at Shepherd Center. So just for fun, I, you know, I, I looked at it and from my you know, knowledge of, of chemistry. I said, boy, that, that looks like something somebody could almost 
you know, make with an organic chemistry set. And so I showed it to our compounding pharmacists and they confirmed it. it was a very, very simple molecule. Where you get nervous with generics is when you have a, bi a biologic agent, like a monoclonal antibody, there with those, um, uh, um, we don't call them generics, call them biosimilars. Those are complex molecules. I would argue that fingolimod or gelenia is a more complex molecule than dimethyl fumarate or tecfidera. So I'm, I'm a little more comfortable with the, the uh, tecfidera uh, generic. Kim asks what your feelings are about mazent. So again, this is in that same S1P modulator class. So it's gelenia, mazent, zaposia, and ponvori. Um, they're all great drugs. Uh, they all have little, little subtle differences, uh, one versus the other. But yeah, we've, we've been very happy with mazent. Courtney wants to know, for a cannabis user, she says, I've seen a lot of different THC compounds. Which ones would you recommend for someone who is a cannabis user that has relapsing remitting MS? So realize with cannabis use, we typically think of cannabis as a symptom manager, not something that changes the long-term course. So it's interesting to think that cannabis might have anti-inflammatory effects and maybe it would lower the risk of relapses or new lesions on MRI. And there, there are theoretical reasons why that could be, but we just haven't proven it yet. So I still think of cannabis as something that we use for symptoms, most commonly spasticity and spasms, neuropathic pain, and, and maybe overactive bladder. We know the most about Delta 9 THC. So this is the, the uh, THC that you're going to find in traditional marijuana. The, where life has gotten very interesting is in most CBD stores around the country, you can find Delta 8 and Delta 10 THC, which are hemp derived. They are legal, but I would say largely unregulated. So the reason Delta 8 THC is legal in all 50 states is because the DEA has not said it's illegal. So the, the, if the DEA has not written a law relative, relevant to a specific molecule, it's, it's technically legal. So it's kind of a loophole. Um, we don't know if the DEA will ever write a law of, for, about Delta-8 THC. I would just say just, you know, a few rules with cannabis. Treat it as a medication. Use the same due diligence as a healthcare consumer when you're thinking about cannabis products that you would use with selecting a prescription drug, know what you're taking, don't get hung up on names and advertising. You want to know how many milligrams of Delta 9 or Delta 8 THC, how many milligrams of CBD. You would like it to come from a reputable source. You would like it to be laboratory tested. You know, if you're in a state where you have regulated dispensaries, obviously those are lab tested. Um, you know, if you're not in one of those states, don't don't be buying cannabis products like Delta 8 THC from the convenience store or gas station. That is probably not a great reputable source. Uh, so yeah, just think of, think of it like medication and uh, do, do your research and know what you're taking. Bruce asks, do you recommend biotin? If so, what dosage? And he asks, uh, Tavis for myelin repair? Yeah, so biotin, there, you know, there has been been some research that would suggest it, it may be of benefit in progressive forms of MS, but the data is not, I would say, especially strong. Biotin is, is a complex molecule. It does interact uh, potentially with other medications and actually can change the results of some lab tests uh, out there. So I'm, I'm not quite ready for, to sign off on biotin yet. Tavis, on the other hand, so the active ingredient in Tavis is clemistine. Clemistine is an antihistamine. And so the interest in Tavis comes out of the uh, work being done at UC San Francisco, where they're searching for FDA-approved molecules that might, as a quirky side effect, repair myelin. So they got a hit in their lab uh, model uh, test tube model on clemistine. And so they took the clemistine molecule, again, it's already FDA approved. It, you know, you, uh, we can uh, prescribe it right now off label. And they tested it in 50 individuals with prior optic neuritis with 
uh, presumed permanent visual loss. It was an open label study. All of these individuals knew they were on treatment. All of the researchers knew they were on treatment. They did see significant visual improvement in those individuals. So that's got that's where everyone's interest is. There is a much larger study going on with clomestine right now. There's a clomestine um, combination study uh, with um, uh, one of our, our diabetes drugs, metformin. So I'm okay with people trying clemestine right now. It is a large dose of clemestine. It's, it's higher than what you would typically use uh, as an allergy medication. And there is the risk it's going to make you drowsy. Um, we still have a lot of questions. That you, so it looked like it might work in optic neuritis. Does that translate into all of MS? Does it mean if I have a spinal cord lesion and I have weakness and numbness in my legs, is it going to help there? In the clemestine optic neuritis trial, they treated people for six months. Does six months cut it in transverse myelitis or other lesions, or do we need to have people on it for a longer period of time? We don't have the answers to those questions yet, but, but uh, clemestine is one of those where I think there's enough science uh, and it's safe enough that I'm willing to try it off-label if someone's really gung-ho to, to try it and risk the, the drowsiness. Andrea says that she's feeling strange sensations when she's swallowing. Um, she wants to know if she should talk to her doctor about it. She also goes on to say that she feels uh, doctors, some doctors, don't really want to treat things until they can actually see it or it's more severe. And she wants to know how long she should wait to mention the symptoms to her neurologist. I think you should mention everything you know, as soon as you have it. So there are a lot of things that you know, with MS that we would like that, that are invisible. I mean, you think about two of the most common symptoms that would take someone out of the workplace, fatigue and cognitive dysfunction. Well, those are largely invisible unless the person tells us about it, unless the cognitive dysfunction is really severe. Um, I take swallowing issues really seriously because there can be um, a cult or hidden aspiration that people uh, have. So if you're having saliva or food or, or liquids go down the wrong direction, that does put you at risk for uh, an aspiration pneumonia. So my threshold to refer someone to a speech language pathologist when they say their swallowing's off is about that much. So you, so it doesn't take much for us to send you to a speech language pathologist that so that's going to be the therapist who deals with dysphagia or swallowing uh, changes if depending upon what they hear in your story there's a pretty good chance that when you're reporting uh, changes in swallowing they're probably going to want to get a modified varium swallow that's kind of like their mri that's how they look at it, how your swallowing is doing swallowing is is a very complex process it happens in certain stages and a lot of things have to happen in just the right sequence for swallowing to be normal so it's not unusual for MS to throw a little, little wrench into their into that process somewhere. An anonymous attendee uh, would like to add vitamin K2 to boost their daily thousand milligram of vitamin D. They said they are only seeing a hundred milligram pills and how much they should take. So the idea with the K2, just for, for folks that are not familiar with it, is so so we know that vitamin D. Uh, is low in probably 85% of people with multiple sclerosis. And vitamin D is not just a bone density vitamin. It plays a huge role in your immune system. As you get your vitamin D levels up into a normal range, typically we think we'd like to see the people in the 50 to 80 range. We know that it has positive effects on your immune system. Other studies have suggested lower rates of relapses and new lesions on MRI when we get vitamin D levels in that, in that good range. If we overshoot with vitamin D, if we give you too much, there is a risk of ectopic calcification. We start depositing calcium in places in your body that we don't want to deposit calcium, like your kidneys, kidney stones, maybe even your coronary arteries so that there could be a higher risk of heart disease. Vitamin K2 may help prevent that ectopic calcification. So that's the idea of putting the K2 with the, the uh, uh, vitamin D is to make it a safer thing to do. There are some protocols out there where they're really taking that theory and running with it. 
doing mega, mega doses of vitamin D, like 100,000 units a day doses of vitamin D, along with mega doses of K2. I get where that theory is. The idea is, well, I'll get more immune protection and not have the risk of the calcification. I, I, I'm, I don't think we now have enough safety data to sign off on that yet. The consequences of being wrong, if you do start having kidney stones or, or uh, calcification of your coronary arteries, that's, that's a pretty significant side effect. On the dosing of the K2, um, I don't know that we know what the perfect dose is to prevent, because it's, it's a still relatively you know, new concept. We know it does, but we don't know the ideal dose. I would probably stick with the 100 um, uh, uh, microgram dosing that that you that sounds like you're on right now versus uh, the the higher dose the, the thousand. Yvonne asks, "What's the wait for physical therapy at Shepherd?" She says she's having difficulty getting in quickly with the hospital that recently diagnosed and discharged her, and she's concerned that if she waits too long to start, she might not get as much functionality back. So I think we are about four to six weeks out right now, but, but that can be adjusted. You know, if, if there is an urgent situation, we can make an, a, you know, a lot of our therapists know um, that, that you know, we need to get people, someone that moved, moved, uh, moved in more quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ideally, I think you, I mean, if you do check around, I mean, if it's, if it's not Shepherd, if it's, I mean, there are lots of physical therapy facilities uh, you know, in the Atlanta metro area, if that's where this, this person I assume is at. Um, I would say, you know, in our area, Kennestone Hospital, the therapists there do a, a really good job. Um, what you want to probably try to avoid if you're going outside of an MS center or someone that, that an MS center has referred you to, just want to be careful with, you know, orthopedic based physical therapists or sports based physical therapists. You want to stick with therapy teams that have some neurological experience, whether it's stroke, spinal cord injury, MS, uh, to, to really get the best results. Karen wants to know your thoughts on grounding mats. Um, I think again, it, that's kind of in the the alternative complementary realm. I, I can't think of any risk associated with that, and I'm I, I think that it's certainly something I would encourage people to if they're interested in trying. I wouldn't. I don't think I don't have any harm with that. I don't have any strong experience with success with with them one way or the other, but I'm certainly open. You know, a lot of these, the things that are more complementary and alternative, it really comes down to that risk benefit ratio. You know, if, if we don't have a double blind placebo controlled trial to say this absolutely works or this absolutely doesn't work, it really comes down to that risk benefit ratio. Is it is it going to bankrupt you? Is it going to hurt you with side effects? If not, and you're interested in trying it, I, I'm certainly open to that. And we have a question from Facebook. Jess wants to know, is sugar a factor in a relapse? Not to our knowledge. I, I totally get where the person's coming from. You know, there is the thought that, you know, diets and a lot of, of sugar, um, that sugar may be inflammatory in some way. And, and I don't think any of us are suffering from a sugar deficiency. So we could probably all cut you know, process sugars out of our diet as much as possible. Um, do I think that they're provocative directly by themselves for relapses? Probably not. Uh, but but again, I, I, I would never discourage someone from trying to get some of the high fructose corn syrup and other bad things that we eat out of our diets. Yeah, I actually did started doing that a couple of weeks ago. And it, it's a difference. I feel, I feel it. I'm a snacker. So it was... Well, it was a tough leap. <laughs> yeah. Um, Most people do feel better when they clean up their diets. I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, it's just getting, normally if you're getting rid of the high fructose corn syrup, you're probably getting rid of a lot of processed foods and higher sodium foods at the same time. So yeah, things like the Whole30 diet where you, you, you eliminate you know, a lot of processed sugars, alcohol. I think they take out legumes for 30 days. Most people will say that their energy levels go way up and they feel better. You know, we don't, when you get rid of a bunch of stuff like that, you don't know, well, which one is the worst offender. And so what Whole30 has you do is then whatever you're missing the most, maybe you have a glass of wine at night and you've given up alcohol with Whole30. So, so if that's what you miss the most, put your glass of wine back in and see how you feel. If your energy levels go down when you put it back in, well, that, that's a problem. And let's, let's keep that off the table. 
True. Bridget asks, is there is a relationship between low cortisol levels and MS? Can working to bring up cortisol levels help with underlying MS symptoms? Yeah, there's, so there's been no um, direct correlation between people with MS having low cortisol uh, overall. Um, you know, when we do things like steroid treatment for MS, we're, we're doing it in a very specific short-term you know, setting. We're doing it to treat a, a relapse. So that, I don't think that counts as, as you, so that clearly would, would change your, your you know, glucocorticoid, or glucocorticoid levels in the short term. But yeah, if there are, so if you have low cortisol, um, you know, it can certainly contribute to fatigue. So when we were talking earlier about not wanting to put all of our symptoms automatically into the MS basket. So that would be something in the background that, you know, when someone comes in with fatigue and MS, we're probably going to do some basic blood work to make sure we're not missing a thyroid problem, some other endocrine problem, you know, uh, anemia, something that could contribute to their fatigue outside of MS. Gus wants to know, uh, what should you expect from your first MRI after starting your first DMT? Hopefully, so if it's your first MRI after starting your DMT, kind of depends upon what your, your MRI looked like before you started your DMT. If you had enhancing lesions or areas of active inflammation, we would hope that we put that fire out with your, with your DMT and that your MRI looks improved. You know, realize that, you know, success with a DMT, regardless of which drug it is, is not necessarily making lesions go away. We should, we should shut down active inflammation and we should prevent new lesions from forming, but it's, it, but we're not going to make you have a normal MRI. So it's those footprints of old lesions, those white spots will always be there to some degree. What those white spots really on MRI really represent in MS is gliosis or scar tissue. Um, when we think about the future of MS and remyelination strategies, so even if we remyelinate all of your MS lesions and improve your level of functioning, you'll, you may still have white spots from the gliosis. You may have normal function within those white spots, but, but there's a lot of research on alternative uh, to standard MRI, things like magnetization transfer ratios that might actually measure remyelination. Isa wants to know, she says, I wanted to know what the difference is between uh, rituximab ABBS and rituximab ARRX. My healthcare provider is changing me uh, from Truxema to that, and I'm a little worried. Yeah. So what's happening is we have with rituximab, because it's been out there for a while, so name brand rituxan is off patent. So there are the biosimilar versions. So there's Truxema and Ruxian. So the name brands of those, those two that she discussed, those are just different letters they put to designate the different biosimilars that are out there. Uh, so it's a it's a way short of the, that, that Truxema or Ruxian's name that you could uh, tell the two apart. Um, we have several insurance carriers here in the Atlanta metro area who have absolutely mandated that our patients go to the biosimilars of, of rituxan, so either Truxema or Ruxian. We have been absolutely happy with, with both of them. We have seen zero issues with either of those biosimilars. Um, the beauty of what she's on, the rituximab, is we don't have to guess as, as to whether the drug's doing what it should be doing. We can do blood tests. We can look at her T and B cell subsets. So CD19 uh, counts or a surrogate marker of what of what rituximab is doing. A person on rituximab should have very low CD19 counts that, that as a, as a uh, B cell subset. Um, so again, you know, when she, if she transitions to this new this other biosimilar, mm -hmm. her neurologist is going to continue to do blood testing to show that not only is she clinically doing well, but that on blood testing the drug is still doing what it should be doing. Karen says, can you talk about loss of hearing in one ear as a first symptom of MS? So we have 12 cranial nerves on each side of our brain stem. And so the eighth cranial nerve is the one that's going to supply hearing to the, to the ear. Why MS doesn't affect hearing more often is a bit of a mystery to us, but it, it's 
fairly unusual. Uh, so whereas we see optic neuritis, visual problems really commonly, um, maybe facial numbness or trigeminal neuralgia, facial pain, pretty commonly in MS, we just don't see a lot of hearing loss. And so when someone has hearing loss, I always want to make sure that we're not missing something else. So I like to get an ear, nose, and throat doctor involved, uh, make sure that there's not something else going on. There are autoimmune attacks on the eighth cranial nerve, so we can see an, an autoimmune hearing loss. So it's not directly related to MS, but it is still autoimmune. Um, there are other neurological conditions out there that can cause hearing loss. So I would just want to make sure that, that that's really from the MS because it is a less common symptom. An anonymous attendee asks a general question. They say um, that they took their first flight last year and they want to travel overseas this year. They have RRMS and they want to know what you recommend. So recommend, I guess that's that's a big one. So recommend in terms of, so we we wouldn't specifically restrict someone's travel uh, with an overlapse or emitting MS diagnosis. You know, there, there's no risk of, of, of air travel. Altitude doesn't seem to impact you know, uh, uh, people with MS any differently than, than anyone else. Um, you know, the, depending upon where you're going, you know, we, we sometimes like to, to have a contingency plan. You know, if you're going to be gone for three months and you're on Tysabri, a monthly infusion, well, we need to think about, okay, we don't want you to go three months without treatment. What if you were to have a relapse? Are you going to be in a fairly remote area? Uh, some For some of our patients who are doing, say, mission work, we may send them out with a little uh, pack of, of, of high-dose oral prednisone because we know they're not going to have access to IV solumedrol in these more remote areas. So we might just come up with some contingency plans. Think about vaccinations, depending upon where you're traveling to. Uh, if you were traveling somewhere where yellow fever or Japanese encephalitis were endemic and you're being asked to get a yellow fever vaccine or a Japanese encephalitis vaccine, there is some data out there that suggests those vaccines could make uh, MS relapse. And so other studies have said no, some have said yes. So we have to have those discussions with people about, is this travel you really have to do? Can we get a waiver for that vaccine? What is, are you going to an area which, which is just rampant with yellow fever? Uh, that you know that we really have maybe the risk of the vaccine is worth it in that setting. Dr. Thrower, we have five more minutes before the hour. Is that uh, how much time can you spare? Yeah, that's good for me. Okay, so let me jump over to some Facebook questions. Elsie asks uh, if you could discuss inflammation and what one can do about treating it. So you know, inflammation is what we think drives the, 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 the attack, is what the immune system is using to damage the myelin and the axons. So the disease-modifying therapies, you know, all of our disease-modifying therapies are ultimately anti-inflammatory. So in the, you know, we would like for most people with MS to be on a disease-modifying therapy. Um, being on a diet that might be anti-inflammatory. So there has been research looking at, say, the Mediterranean diet, paleo diets, intermittent fasting, and you can find some evidence that all of those may actually tone down inflammation as measured by certain blood markers of inflammation. Uh, supplements like turmeric that are, are potentially anti-inflammatory. Uh, one of our researchers here has been looking at, at uh, studies on the effect of exercise on inflammation. Um, there are a lot of benefits to exercise. There are you know, physical benefits, emotional benefits. So far, we've not been able to show that it actually lowers markers of inflammation on in the blood or spinal fluid, but again, a lot of other, uh, other benefits from, from doing that. So um, again, I would think about healthy diet, something like turmeric, and then um, uh, being, a, if it's appropriate, being on a, a disease-modifying therapy. Dottie wants to know if MS uh, causes peripheral neuropathy, and if so, does it contribute to Charcot foot? So peripheral neuropathy is a specific diagnosis. So by definition, when we say peripheral neuropathy, we mean something that's damaging the peripheral nerves in the arms and legs. 
multiple sclerosis is a central nervous system problem, not a peripheral problem. So, so the demyelination and axonal damage in the MS are in the brain and spinal cord. The symptoms of peripheral neuropathy can mimic the symptoms of MS. Both people would say diabetic neuropathy and multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis can have burning and tingling in their feet. Very different causes. One is in the brain and spinal cord, one's in the peripheral nerves, but the symptoms are going to be fairly similar. So Charcot joints are usually the result of a peripheral neuropathy. So it sounds like this person may have a legitimate peripheral neuropathy and a, a secondary complication, the Charcot joint, but that's totally separate from their, their multiple sclerosis. An anonymous attendee asks your opinion on the Walls protocol. So I have a lot of respect for, for Terry Walls. Uh, so, so she's a physician with uh, living with MS. So the wall, a lot of people mistakenly think of the Walls protocol as a diet. Uh, the diet is a part of it, but it's bigger than that. It's, it's also the exercise component, the stress management component. Um, she has done a study on the whole uh, protocol itself, showing that people who followed the protocol over a year reported an improvements in quality of life. From that study, we don't know, was it the diet piece? Was it the stress management piece? Was it the uh, exercise piece? Was it all of them combined? She is doing a diet only study um, with looking at that. So her diet is sort of a modified paleo diet. Um, there have been some studies that have looked at different diets. Uh, again, as we mentioned, so you can find some data looking at intermittent fasting, Mediterranean, and paleo diets. And they, there's some data on all of those showing that they may be anti-inflammatory. Um, if you were to talk to a nutritionist about the paleo diet, what you're going to find is that most nutritionists are probably not as thrilled with it as they would be, say, a, a Mediterranean diet. The nutritionists generally don't like diets that take major food groups out of your life forever. And they worry that those diets might not be sustainable over long periods of time, uh, that, it, that it's just not human nature to restrict. So, so that would be the, the, the probably the, the um, criticism uh, that would come from nutritionists on the Walls Protocol is the diet part, the paleo, modified paleo part of the diet. So it looks like I'll um, close out with the question from Julio. He wants to know if there's any information regarding alpha lipoic acid helping in MS. Yeah, so there are uh, several small studies that have suggested that alpha lipoic acid, you know, may have some some benefit in in um, neuroprotection and maybe even helping reverse some symptoms. Again, these are very small studies, and it, it's always it's so hard to know if that translates into, you know, the general population of people with, with MS. So uh, I know that there are some larger studies going on. I think, again, alpha lipoic acid um, is something where there's not a lot of risk associated with it. And so, I, again, it's one of those I, I certainly wouldn't discourage someone. One of the challenges I think we see with a lot of the alternative and complementary therapies is there's so much literature on little studies on these things. So, you know, so if someone were to take every supplement out there where there's a little bit of data, you know, at some point you end up with a tackle box full of supplements and where there is, there is some concern is, so there might be a study that looks at alpha lipoic acid, or there might be a study that is looked at you know, say clemestine and in, in, uh, remyelination, there aren't a lot of studies that put all these things together. So when you, if you say, I'm going to take all of these things where there's a little bit of data, we don't know what that looks like at all in the real world. Are you, you know, are there actual, are you negating the benefits that you might get from one of these things? So, so that's, I think, one of the challenges. It's almost like you have to pick one thing. And I think in medicine in general, I'm a big fan of when we change variables, we put you on a new medication. We do a lifestyle modification as much as possible. I like to try to just change one thing at a time that way and give it a period of time, three months, six months, you know, whatever is appropriate for that intervention so that we really know is this, is this intervention helping, hurting, doing nothing. When you change a bunch of things all at the same time and then you have side effects or benefit, we really don't know which one is doing it. 
Dr. Thrower, uh, we are two minutes past the hour. I uh, don't know if you would be able to answer the last questions via oh. email, or would you prefer to finish? Oh, cool. Let's go ahead. Okay, great, perfect. So an anonymous attendee says that they take NyQuil and a small amount of melatonin to help with sleep and it works, but are there concerns with uh, continuing this medication? So, so the part of the NyQuil that, that's making you drowsy is, is the Benadryl part or the diphenhydramine. You know, almost any over-the-counter medicine that, that makes you drowsy, chances are it's the diphenhydramine that, that's doing it. So most over-the-counter sleep aids, for instance, it, it's the diphenhydramine. Um, there's not any long-term side effect risk that we know of with the diphenhydramine. I think the things you do have to watch out for is it, it's going to dry your mouth out. It's potentially constipating. And in some people, it can linger into the next day. So some people with diphenhydramine, you know, it helps them sleep at night, but they might feel just a little cognitively slowed into the next day from that just lingering effect. Um, melatonin tends to be fairly short acting. So you take a dose at bedtime, it should be out of your system the next day. There is almost a mythology out there that, that melatonin could have, have negative effects in the immune system and people with autoimmune diseases. That's never really been borne out in any, any real world setting. So I'm, I'm fine with people uh, with MS taking melatonin. Typically people are doing three milligrams. So you're probably getting 25 milligrams of diphenhydramine and three milligrams of, of melatonin. Um, is it, again, if, as long as you're not feeling runny or hungover the next day, I, I think that that's probably okay. You know, if, you know, the alternative is, would be a prescription sleep aid, and those have risks of their own uh, that we see. I mean, probably my favorite thing is the sleep aid that I think has the best safety profile is, is probably just over-the-counter CBD, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of, of 15 to 30 milligrams at bedtime. I think it's a, a nice, safe sleep aid. It, it's interesting because it tends to not pe make people drowsy. What it does is it just kind of helps you turn your brain off a little bit. And then when you do get to sleep, it tends to promote just a much deeper and more restful sleep uh, for, for people. So, so if someone out there is having sleep issues and they've not tried CBD, I would certainly take a look at that. Alicia from Facebook wants to know if it is of help or does it hurt someone with an overactive immune system to take vitamins that say they'll boost your immune system? Yeah, so in, in theory, you know, MS is a relatively overactive immune system. So in theory, we would probably avoid, you know, stimulating an already overactive immune system. That said, when something says it stimulates your immune system, your next question should be, what part of my immune system? If you're stimulating my regulatory part of my immune system, that's probably a good thing. You could probably argue that part of what vitamin D does is it upregulates T regulatory cells and helps kind of calm down a, an overactive immune system. That's a good thing. I don't, so when we get up to you know, other things like echinacea, um, I don't know that we know if, if, does it really stimulate your immune system? And if it does, what parts does it stimulate? Uh, that said, you know, we've had people with MS take echinacea for years, and I don't think I've ever seen anyone have anything uh, negative happen from it. But yeah, so it's a good question, and I completely get where she's coming from. I, I think with a, with some supplements, we just don't know, are they truly stimulating your immune system? And if so, what? You know, people during the COVID pandemic have been doing a lot of things like elderberry, uh, you know, as an immune protectant. I, I see absolutely no down negatives in, in people with MS taking something like elderberry, elderberry or vitamin C. Caroline says, you mentioned that Zaposia was a good drug in the, in the same class as Jelenia. Are there any heart-related risks since they require an EKG before starting? So generally the risk, so what you're worried about with this class of drugs, uh, the, the S1P modulators is, is bradycardia. Uh, so they can, you, the receptors that they work at, these SP receptors are in lymph nodes. So that's, that's the, the way they work in MS. 
Well, some, some of these receptors are also in cardiac conduction tissue. So when you take your first dose of, of some of these drugs, you do have the risk of slowing down your heart rate. Usually that's only an issue with the first dose of these medicines. As we've gotten the newer versions, so Jeleni was our first one, and then we had Mazent, and then Zaposia, and then Pumpport. That risk of the cardiac side effect has gone down and down and down. They're making these drugs more specific to the immune system and less likely to affect that cardiac conduction tissue. I think this is a million dollar question coming up, Dr. Power, <laughs> from Mary. She says, are we getting any closer to myelin repair strategies on patiently waiting? Yes, we are. I wish that it was moving faster, but that is, we mentioned the three buckets of MS care, relapse management, symptom management, stop progression, myelin repair, reversing disability, you know, is, is the, the holy grail. It is the fourth bucket. So there are a lot of different strategies being used to attack that. We mentioned earlier the clomestine. So the research that's being done at places like UC San Francisco, where they're trying to repurpose FDA-approved drugs to see if they might remyelinate. Uh, we're doing here a study uh, with, with um, mesenchymal stem cells for remyelination. So that's another avenue. And th there are other stem cell projects out there. So we're, we're just one of you know uh, many different uh, projects that are, that are going on. So... I think the other thing that gives me great hope is it's not just an MS issue. There are other health issues like spinal cord injury and even glaucoma, where glaucoma damages the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is, you know, um, you know if we repair myelin and repair nerve cells, you know, you could see a return of function. All of these different health issues have teams of researchers working on repair strategies. So maybe the MS for us, I'm sorry, the answer for us in the MS world may not come from the MS world. What if it comes from the spinal cord injury world? I don't think any of us care where it comes from as long as it eventually you know, happens. So yes, I am hopeful. I do think it'll happen. Uh, I wish I had an exact timeline for it. Me too, but I'm glad that it's moving in the right direction now. Terry asks, besides walking or using a treadmill, what's the best workout machine to help walking or strengthening legs? Yeah, I think the best workout machine is the one you, that you have access to and that you will stick with over a long period of time. So there, it's really, there's no single best machine out there. Um, some people prefer lower impact machines like an elliptical or a stair climber where your feet are never actually leaving the device. Um, there is research that has looked at the use of down slope treadmill. Normally when you get on a treadmill, you think about walking in a flat plane or you elevate it so you're walking uphill. So Shepherd Center, in combination with researchers from Emory and other places, looked at a study that said, what if we had you walk downhill on the treadmill? Um, the surprising result were that people doing the downslope treadmill felt like it was a much easier exercise, and they actually got more benefit from it. Um, so if you're some of the newer treadmills do actually have that feature, you can tilt them down. So what was done in the study was six degrees of downhill. Uh, we went old school, uh, we did not have treadmills that, that did that automatically, we just jacked up the back with wooden blocks and, and got the effect that, that way. So if you're thinking about a piece of equipment, really try to try it out if, if you can, if at all possible, go to if it's a store or if they have that piece of equipment at a you know a gymnasium that you could try it out. You know, some of these things are expensive and you, what you don't want it to do is end up as just a very overpriced place to hang your laundry at. I'm intrigued by that um, downhill treadmill. I've not even heard of that uh, new feature, but I'm kind of Jerry Lewis clumsy, so I don't know if I'll be on that. <laughs> I think most people on treadmills are going to probably feel more comfortable holding on to the front or side rails, but yeah, but but people really did, and these were people with MS, they really didn't feel like it was a much easier exercise to, to accomplish. I would just add one other exercise option. This is a little fancier, and you would probably have to do this through a, a physical therapist, but um, so FES bicycles, 
So functional electrical stimulation stationary bikes. So this is a stationary bike and the bike itself is nothing fancy, but what, so what the physical therapist is gonna do is while you're on that bike, is they're actually gonna put functional electrical stimulation electrodes over your major muscles in your legs so that when you start fatiguing and that signal can't get from brain to the spinal cord to the legs, the machine is gonna take over. Uh, it's going to, that the FES is going to start firing those muscles for you. So uh, uh, we've we've done two studies that have shown that your that what using doing those training sessions actually translated into better walking in the uh, in the real world and better endurance in the real world. Isa asks. Uh, she says I was initially diagnosed with Bell's palsy before getting diagnosed with MS, and five years later, uh, is there a common misdiagnosis? So, common misdiagnosis. so, so technically, Bell's palsy is a peripheral nerve issue, kind of like the peripheral neuropathy question, but it is autoimmune. So it is an autoimmune attack on the, the, the seventh cranial nerve or the facial nerve, and that causes the Bell's palsy. There are so a couple of questions when we see that story is, was the was the Bell's palsy and then your MS diagnosis, were they unrelated? Was it just, but they're both autoimmune. So it's kind of a little smoking gun if it was Bell's palsy. That said, Bell's palsy is very common. And most people who get isolated Bell's palsy do not go on to develop MS, but they are both autoimmune. Or was the Bell's palsy really not a Bell's palsy? Was it really a facial paralysis due to a brainstem lesion that was mimicking the, a Bell's palsy? And so that we don't have any way of knowing that retro, retrospectively, but that that is a possibility as well. Bruce says he's on Ocrevus uh, and wants to know if he can make antibodies with any vaccines now since his B cells are depleted. So, so new vaccines, new boosters that, that your body has not seen before, um, the Ocrevus will likely impair your body's ability to make that antibody response. Again, doesn't mean you don't get any response. You still should get a T cell response to vaccination, but the antibody response to any new vaccine is, is probably lessened while you're on Ocrevus. So as you, you know, when you go off of Ocrevus someday, uh, it probably takes at least six months, sometimes more, for those B cells to reconstitute, and then you're kind of back to your your usual state. M says, "Do you feel an anti an anti inflammatory diet or a paleo diet is the best overall for MS patients?" It's hard to say what's best because it's very individual. I I think that if you put the average person with MS in front of me and just think about lifestyle, sustainability, I probably would lean a little bit more towards a Mediterranean diet for the average person, just because I think it's more sustainable. Um, if someone's very regimented, they're very really committed to that paleo diet. Again, there is data out there to say it, it is anti-inflammatory. Uh, so I think you just really need to think about what's gonna fit your lifestyle best. Yvonne says, are there any anti-inflammatory supplements you would recommend uh, to complement diet? She says she's currently using uh, glucosamine and curcumin. curcumin? I'm sorry. So I think of uh, curcumin and kind of turmeric is in the same camp. So one of those, uh, if, if someone's going to take something, a supplement that they want to be anti-inflammatory, I would probably go with either turmeric or the uh, uh, curcumin. An anonymous attendee said, uh, you said hearing loss is rare. How about hearing distortion, such as not being able to distinguish foreground from background sound, also tinnitus? So tinnitus would probably be uh, right there with hearing loss as, as uncommon. The hearing distortion, I would say, might be more common than, than true hearing loss or tinnitus because hearing distortion might not be a problem with the nerve itself. That may be actually a problem in the brain. So the way you're, you're deciphering noise and, and speech could be affected due to an MS lesion. That, that to me would probably be a, a little bit more common than just straightforward hearing loss and tinnitus. I don't know if this is a typo or what, but Karen uh, says, what are your thoughts on N-U-S-T-E-P and M-S? 
N U S T. What's the rest of that one? It's <laughs> it looks like new step. Like that's the way oh, it looks. There's like yeah, a new step is a is an exercise. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If, yeah, we have several patients who use uh, new step. Absolutely fine. Um, yeah, uh, no no problems with that. And we have one more question from Facebook, and this is the final one. So it's from Muhammad. He asks, is there a phenotype for MS before official diagnosis and objective findings? So yes. Yeah. So when someone's MS is diagnosed, we know that's not really when your MS started, that there clearly is a prodrome. So, so you have the genetic part of MS. So, so there are over 200 plus genes that have been identified that put a person at risk for MS. So obviously you're born with those. Then there are the environmental factors, things like Epstein-Barr virus exposure, low vitamin D levels. We think those environmental risk factors are probably in place age 15 or so in that in that ballpark so so the table was probably set for a person to have ms by the time they were 15 years of, of age or so and then if you look at kind of what happens before an official ms diagnosis there was a study last year that looked at visits to primary care providers in people with ms before their ms was diagnosed and they clearly went to primary care providers more often for vague symptoms before their official MS diagnosis. And some of these symptoms were things like fatigue. I mean, if you go into your family doctor or family practice doctor and, and just complain of tiredness, MS may not be the first thing they think of. There are a thousand other potential explanations for fatigue, and they're probably not gonna you know, order an MRI as their first, uh, first diagnostic test. Uh, so there is this, this prodrome that we think happens. There's also a phenomenon called a radiographic isolated syndrome. So these are individuals who have MRI findings suggestive of MS who've never had a true relapse uh, or even an abnormal neurological exam. So they've got a smoking gun MRI, but they've not had any symptoms yet. And we know that a lot of those individuals, when followed over time, will go on to develop MS. The hard question, we don't know quite what to do with them when we only see the abnormal MRI, do, because that's not, by our current diagnostic guidelines, that's not an MS diagnosis. Do we start that person on a disease-modifying therapy? What if they weren't going to have symptoms for 20 years down the line? Yeah, no, no right answer uh, to that. So there is, a, there is some type of prodrome that, that, that occurs before an MS diagnosis. Well, thank you so much for staying a little later past the time. I'm glad we were able to get all the questions through. Um, in a minute or so, I am about to have a serious conversation with my mom who's watching Tex Avery cartoons right now. And I'm afraid the explosions and stuff, it's, I don't know if it's picked up, but if it has, I'm sorry. Uh, not a, not <laughs> on my end. <laughs> but it's more lively. We, yeah. Yeah, I love those cartoons they're awesome i'm gonna go join her in a minute there you go but, uh if that's all the time that we have for today guys if you did miss any part of this um after we close out the conference on zoom uh it will be available to watch on facebook because the live stream will end and the recording will be there as well in a few weeks, hopefully, this will also be on the YouTube channel, Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and you can subscribe there to get updates when we do upload new content. You can also subscribe to um, or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information for our other conferences. Our next teleconference will be this Friday, February 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time with Damian Washington and a panel who will be sharing their experiences as Black men who live with MS. Our sincere thanks to everybody who attended and asked questions. And thank you again, Dr. Ben. Uh, it's always good to co-host with you and just take these questions one by one. It's really awesome to uh, talk to you again. Awesome. Everyone have a good evening. You too.